Hello everyone, Jeremy Fernandez here with the top stories on ABC News, which is, uh, of course, coronavirus. It's uh, making news all over the world. I'm with Sophie Scott, uh, our medical reporter here at the ABC, along with our GP, Dr Brad Mackay, uh, to answer some of your questions on this live stream. We'll be going for the next um, 37 minutes or so, uh, so please send them in. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook, you know where to leave the comments, right below, leave your questions. And same with uh, YouTube as well, if you're watching through our YouTube channel. Let's get straight into it. Uh, welcome to both of you. This has been moving very, very quickly, hasn't it, this past week? It seems to be the case that there are developments every minute or two. It's very, very fast moving. It's hard to keep up, but you do get the sense that in the last 24 to 48 hours there's been a big shift. Brad, would you agree in, yeah. in, in we're, what we're experiencing when it comes to coronavirus? We've been seeing things develop overseas, and uh, I think we've all sort of been thinking about it in our heads, but from a, from a health profession, it was really Monday this week mm -hmm. that, uh, that we really started going, oh my God, this is, this is real, uh, this just isn't happening uh, over in Europe and, and in yeah. China. Uh, we really need to do something about it now. It's so. hitting very, very close to home. So let's go to our first question from Richard Eggleston. He asks, I have flu-like symptoms, but I haven't travelled or had any contact with confirmed cases. Should I self-isolate? Now, this has been a big issue, hasn't it? Because there was some advice that if you did have those symptoms, that you should go and get tested, get the coronavirus test and then self-isolate. But they've sort of pushed back from that, Brad, haven't they? Now they've really been quite specific. They were, they were really overwhelmed. Doctors were overwhelmed with the worried well come and getting tested. So just having the symptoms alone wouldn't really be enough, would it? Brad? Yeah, so the, the criteria at the moment, um, our guidance for, for doctors, is that it, you need to have been travelling overseas in the last 14 days um, and also have um, symptoms as well. Uh, people are being advised if they've come back from overseas, then they should self-isolate uh, if they can uh, for 14 days. Um, from, from any uh, destination. But if you haven't been in contact with anybody who's been diagnosed with coronavirus, um, then yeah, like a, we're not being advised to swab people for that. Is that a difficulty in the way it's set up? Because, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know. Say if you're walking on a street or you hit the crosswalk button or you hand over some money, can you get coronavirus without knowing that you've come to contact with someone who has been overseas, who has the virus and may not know? Mm. Well, this is, this is the weird thing about the criteria, is that we're presuming that we're only getting cases that are being brought in uh, externally from overseas. But we know that coronavirus is pretty easily transmitted from human to human. So you could definitely not have gone overseas at all and be unwilling, like, unwittingly aware uh, that you've been in contact with the virus. And we certainly know now, both in New South Wales and Victoria, there are cases of community transmission. So yeah. that's people getting it in the community that haven't been overseas. So that's starting to build momentum. So you'll probably see the criteria change for yeah. testing, you yeah. know, almost from day to day. Like they've, they've brought in now the, uh, the rebates for telehealth so you can get um, a consultation with a doctor over the telephone or over the internet, and that's only just recent. Uh, you'll probably see that, you know, there will be, there will be changes. So that, I think the testing um, criteria will evolve as well. So it's really important to keep up with uh, the latest advice as well. And this is why we're covering this story so much, because the developments are happening so rapidly. Theresa Day writes in, and she makes a really, really good point here. I'm concerned, she says, as a 46-year-old woman with an autoimmune disorder and a heart condition, I think the media and health officials need to talk more about how this is not a disease that solely targets the elderly or those with diabetes. This is a lot bigger than that, isn't it? Yeah, so look, I noticed just um, recently the, the Victor Chang organisation have put out a thing for patients with heart conditions saying very specifically you should wash your hands, stay away from crowds, um, make sure you minimise contact with people. So they're recognising that, you know, not only the elderly are at risk, but people with those chronic conditions, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, all put people at an increased risk of contracting, not only contracting the condition, but having side effects and symptoms. Brad, anything to add to that? I mean, we, we sort of think about the burden this is going to place on the health system, and it's not just from coronavirus cases, but, you know, if you have a car accident, for instance, you may not be able to get the help that you need, and that's got nothing to do with coronavirus as far as you're concerned. Yeah, so uh, what, what people may not realise is that hospitals everywhere around Australia are going into crisis mode. So outpatient clinics are being cancelled. Um, so if there's anything that's non-urgent, that's just going out the window completely. Uh, and this is to make way for ICU beds so people can get, can get intensive care if they're needing it. It's also to clear emergency departments as much as possible. Um, and, and we are sort of fearing for the worst, or at least preparing for the worst and hoping that it isn't as bad as what we anticipate. 
Um, but this will delay care. So if, if you don't have a, an urgent operation, um, then, yeah, you'll, you'll be put um, probably on the waiting list and that will blow out for as long as we're sort of um, waiting for and we don't know how long it's yeah. going to be. So we had a number of people writing and asking if they should cancel things like colonoscopies, endoscopies, elective surgery in they'll, general, they'll go on the front They'll probably find they're cancelled anyway yeah. or, or <laughs> yeah. put back, so it may not be their yeah. choice in the end. Um, it might sound like a, a draconian thing to be pushing elective surgery back, but it's actually, it's actually good practice. It's actually making the capacity there so that if things get do, too bad, they've got the ability to take on extra patients to free up the ICU beds and things like that. So it's really uh, waiting to make sure you're acting before something happens. Uh, so we've been receiving a ton of questions, uh, not only through Facebook and YouTube, but also through the ABC News website. Um, and I have to say, there's some really terrific questions here, which I don't know the answer to. <laughs> this is why we've got you here. Uh, is it possible that mosquitoes can spread the virus? Uh, there hasn't been any uh, documented evidence of that, and I'd, I'd highly doubt it. I don't think that that's going to be a, a mode of transmission at all. Uh, pH neutral soap, someone asks, is it effective? I oh, look, I, I mean, I wouldn't have thought so. The, the, the advice is basically just to wash your hands, to keep your hands as clean as possible with soap, ideally bar soap. I've heard that bar soap is actually better than liquid soap and hand sanitizer is good as well, but I haven't heard anything more that pH soap can make more Brad, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so any soap that you use is basically going to dislodge the, the virus um, and other bacteria that can be so on your hands. it's about washing away the fats and yeah, the oils so on your hands. It's a physical change um, that's going to be washing away the virus and putting it down the sink. Um, so if you're using alcohol, alcohol-based hand gels, then that's going to be helpful as well. Um, but yeah, the best thing is still going to be soap and water. Uh, again, some really great questions. These are coming in through our website as well. We've received, honestly, thousands of questions over the past few uh, couple of weeks. If you're ordering takeaway, is it better to only get hot dishes and stay away from things like salads? Does temperature play a role here in the survivability of the virus? I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, it's interesting. I noticed um, that some of the companies that deliver food have put out a thing saying if you don't want to come into contact with your, say, Uber Eats driver, just let us know and you can, we'll tell you when we're at the front door and we'll drop it off. But that's not really to do with what's inside. That's just to minimise contact with people. But no, I'm not aware of anything to do with um, the safety, food safety being an issue and whether it can survive in, in food and things like that. So certainly temperature does play a role. We sort of find that the, that the virus is more likely to... Um, degenerate and fall apart at higher temperatures. So if your meal is cooked, then yeah, like you're probably going to destroy the virus in that process. But then if somebody does have coronavirus and they have it on their hands and then put that touch your plate, then your plate isn't really going through a, a furnace. Mm. So it could still transmit from, uh, from hard surface to, to person. And how long does that surface, say a plate or a bench top or a crosswalk button, whatever, how long does the virus stay alive on that surface? Mm depending on the weather. Um, uh, some of the studies show that it could be even up to nine days that it could be sitting on a surface. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's hopefully a few hours, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, it depends on the, on the heat, the temperature, the weather. And this is something that we really need to address mm. because this is such a new virus. There's a lot that we don't know about it. Exactly. One of the, probably the most, one of the most interesting things has been just how much science has been done about this virus and how quickly it's getting out mm. to the public, which has been really good. Like often uh, you'll see papers that take weeks and months to get into scientific journals they're turning stuff around really quickly because the public needs to know this information when I mean, we need to know but the public needs to know so you know even the advice about how long this virus lasts on surfaces if you asked us last week we might have given you one answer but there's been other papers since then giving you a different answer so yeah the information's evolving really rapidly and so if you want to know why we're covering this so uh, so religiously over the past couple of weeks it's partly because of that that the advice is changing uh, we've had a lot of questions here uh, that relate uh, to um, what happens if you get the virus. Does it cause long-term damage? I mean, for a lot of people who've been sick, you know that when you contract an illness of some sort, your body's never quite the same. Is it the same with this? What do you think, Brad? I mean, I certainly, I've read some papers showing that people who've had like severe symptoms have had lung scarring as a result of having the virus. But then I think it's really important to remind everybody that for the majority of people who get coronavirus, 80% of people will have a mild illness. And those people will probably recover and not have any long-term damage. Those people who have the more serious end of the spectrum, are they're the ones that may have some issues like lung scarring. But we're not seeing lots of research showing long, lots of long-term impacts, which is good. But again, we're still pretty early days, so it's hard, hard to say definitively. 
But I'd say certainly in the people who get the mild to moderate illnesses, we're not seeing ongoing problems. Brad, Sophie raises a really interesting point about how most people who get this are not going to be deeply, deeply unwell. They're going to have some mild symptoms similar to a cold and only a small percentage of those people are going to die. So there's a huge recovery rate here. How do we then process that about, uh, in, in terms of scale, a lot of people say we should keep this in perspective. What does perspective look like to you as a doctor? Yeah, so I suppose I, I look at it from a numbers perspective. So we are, we're talking here about the first wave of a virus coming across Australia and going around the world. And we're expecting about 20% of the population to be infected with coronavirus. So as Sophie was saying, about 80% of those people will just get mild symptoms. Some people may have it and not even get any symptoms at all. And we're finding that some people are still able to spread the virus, even though they don't have uh, any, any symptoms, no fever, no cough. Um, um, but then we're, we've also got that 20% of people who will be moderately to severely unwell, who may need uh, to have oxygen or even be put on ventilators. And then we're expecting about 1% of the people who are uh, infected to die from that as well. So um, uh, you're saying about like long-term damage. There have been some studies that have suggested long-term scarring, mm -hmm. but again, like it's only been out for a few months, so I, I can't really said that's going to be a real a real thing we haven't really had it for the <laughs> long so term good. so yeah. it's yeah. hard to know but I, I think it is great to keep it in perspective yeah. though that that 80 percent yeah. people mm -hmm. will have a mild illness so this is a really d interesting distinction to make because a lot of people and there have been articles written mm -hmm. about this talking about hysteria um, and making that distinction between panic mm -hmm. hysteria and being concerned and vig vigilant mm -hmm. they're not all the same thing are they no, definitely not. And like, I think it's it's prudent to be concerned and organised. Uh, but you could you could see when when we started to write stories about the virologist telling us, you know, you should maybe stock up on a few extra items, you know, put a few things away in case you need to be at home for two weeks. We saw that good in, good advice taken to be, you know, people rushing off to you know stock by three months worth of by stuff. three months worth yeah. of mm. toilet paper. Yeah. So that that was a very quick change from what was pretty good and sensible advice to people really taking it too far and you know you can just sense in the last you know it's the panic is building people need to really just be make sure they're getting good up-to-date information be organized be concerned but but don't panic because really that's not helpful for you or your family or or society for us to be panicking about this um, and some of the most consistent advice all the way through in a very quickly evolving situation is to wash your hands and to it's cover your mouth and your yeah. it's it's it comes down to real you basics, know, like, doesn't it? It's, uh, we deal with modern medicine with all its amazing inventions, uh, but yet we're still basically telling people to wash their hands. Yep. Yep. Mm. But th this is basic flu advice as well. So every season we're, we're, we're saying this all the time, wash your hands, <laughs> you must yeah. use yeah. So a gel. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things that I remind people to do as well is like make sure that you're wiping down your, your mobile phone mm. so that will often carry all sorts of different uh, um, germs. Um, so it's important to make sure that that's being done as well because otherwise you're washing your hands and then you'll go straight back onto your phone and start texting and get um, potential coronavirus back on your fingers again. Now as you know there's been some breaking news in the last sort of 20 minutes or so the Prime Minister announcing that non-essential mass events with more than 500 people will be cancelled from Monday so not from this weekend because of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this does not include schools or public transport. Brad is this a good idea? It's definitely a very good idea. Um, so a, a similar thing has just happened in Ireland as well. So, uh, so mass gatherings, more than 500 people outdoors. Um, they've also gone to the next step of saying not more than 100 people indoors for, for, for gatherings. So uh, they're going even further than Australia for that. But this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create distance between people um, so the, the virus doesn't have that chance to spread from person to person. So I'm very glad that they've, uh, they've just recently cancelled the Grand Prix in Melbourne. Um, this was a, a big sense of anxiety for so many health professionals around because having more than um, half a, uh, a quarter Three, of a yeah. million people, 300,000, 300, yeah. um, that would just be a, a petri dish full of viruses yeah. that could just spread and, uh, and create a, a, a massive um, rise in the number of cases around Melbourne and uh, around Australia. And Jeremy, the interesting thing about this situation is we, we haven't faced a situation before, well not in my lifetime, where instead of just thinking about yourself and your own behaviour, you actually need to think about how your behaviour can impact the whole community. Because if you decide to go to an event, say a mass event that might be on, you might contract the virus, which, and you might not get sick, but you might then um, infect your elderly neighbour mm. or your grandmother. 
And so for once, we actually need to think about something greater than our own well-being. We need to mm. think about acting in the best interests of the community. And that's something that we really haven't had to do in this way before. So it's a real mind shift, isn't it, Brad? Is oh, that... I sort of disagree. Like we, we talk about vaccinations all the time and we encourage people to get vaccinated. And that may, you, like, you may get pneumococcal pneumonia True. and you'll be all right, yeah. but you may give it to your, your elderly grandparent and, and they could die from it. So we're used to having those vaccination messages, but the, this is like a, a bit of level. a different yeah. sort of like level. Yeah, so we, we don't have a vaccine available, so we can't say get vaccinated. Um, but it's it's trying to prevent getting the vac the, the virus itself, yeah. and um, yeah, trying to try not to transmit it around your family. Oh, I do want to come back to this question of vaccines in a moment, but mm. uh, on this note of cancelling uh, mass events from Monday, Die Sky asks, why aren't we closing schools? Should schools and universities be closing as well? I think it's only a matter of time. I think mm. the universities are already um, making pr mm. preparations for that. And we've seen a number of students being diagnosed a as well at schools. A number of students have been diagnosed. Um, you know, I know Sydney University is already um, planning for online classes, U UTS, other universities around Australia. That is in place. So we haven't actually seen... I saw someone on social media today saying which university is going to blink first. In mm. other words, once mm. one says it, that they'll all follow. Right. So I think that's something to look out for in the next sort of 24 to 48 hours. Uh, Brad, your thoughts? I mean would that be the prudent thing to do to, as they say, flatten the curve? Yeah, so over in Italy, they've, they stopped people from going to school and they, they, teachers were like desperately <laughs> trying to organise lessons that they could do online and, and people are adapting to that. And I think we're living in a, an age of technology where that is possible, that we can have classes at home, um, but we need to rejig our lives to accommodate for that. And I, I think people are doing that mental arithmetic to try to figure out how to, how to do that and, uh, and if they can do that. Uh, but, but it is prudent to do it. I, I agree with Sophie. It's a matter of time. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues is that kids can still get the virus. They may not get incredibly well, like unwell from it. They may be looking completely fine, um, but then they'll bring it home and spread it around the family. So they're, they're a great breeding ground for the viruses, and uh, we need to not forget that. And one, of these, one of the things about looking at the pattern of spread of this virus mm -hmm. is it really spreads in families. So uh, if someone in the family has it, you, you're pretty much finding that if they're at home in quarantine, the whole family will get it. So that's why as well they're worried about children because if they, could, if they bring it back, uh, they, while well, they might be fine, the, their whole family will get Most likely will, will be fine. Most and likely. this, this is one of the weird well, parts yeah. of our, our yeah. quarantining at the moment is yeah. that somebody could come back home from China and then they're under quarantine, but the rest of the family, family is going in and out of the house. Like this hasn't made sense to me at all mm -hmm. from yeah. that quarantining advice. So if one person's at risk, then everybody's at risk in the family. Uh, and Which is why Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, is under yeah, quarantine well, as well because diagnosed. his wife's been diagnosed. Yeah. So by association, that means yeah. he's under quarantine as well. The interesting mm. thing about this, this virus as well is that you sort of think that, you know, you, you feel like people like that, like politicians and, and movie stars and <laughs> would be immune from something like this. But to, it really brings it home to people. Wow, if Tom Hanks can get it, yeah. anyone can get it. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, I've got, well, there's so many questions coming in. Uh, Judy Richardson asks, how long after contact do most people show symptoms? It's, would you... Would you it's difficult to say mm. because uh, f for some people um, they can have the virus and have no symptoms. Other people, um, I'd say within a, around five days, they're sort of they're sort of that, that's their best guesstimate, I, I would imagine. Brad, the would average, agree? yeah. So the, uh, there's a bell curve. So yeah. most of the cases are sort of hovering around that five days mm -hmm. where people would start to show symptoms after exposure. But it can also go up to about 14 days, is our estimate at the moment. Um, and the the suggestion, again, this is all moving very quickly, yeah. is that um, people could be infectious for about 48 hours before showing symptoms. Um, Again, that's a bit of a guess at this point of time. Um, or they could be infectious and not have any symptoms at all. So uh, that, that's a difficulty yeah. at this point. And the, the two-week quarantine period, they're also uh, thinking hopefully they might be able to crunch that down a little bit. And the UK is looking at making it one-week quarantine. Yeah. So that could be something as well. Hopefully. Which is interesting because a couple mm. of weeks ago they were talking about making it possibly Longer. three weeks. Yeah. Mm. It's just not knowing much about yeah. the virus at all and yeah. Yeah, trying to be conservative in our yeah. approach. I mean, yeah. the two weeks is definitely conservative, yeah. um, but, but I think for people's sanity and peace of mind, I'm sure yeah. if they could crunch it down to a week, people would be happier. But they're really... Australia's acted um, quite swiftly and quite conservatively in a lot of ways, which has been good, I think. I, I think and just in the last few days, I've been noticing a bit more disquiet with... There's quite a momentum developing, There's a momentum there? developing, yeah. and I think the announcements that, you know, about the mass gatherings is something that a lot of people will really welcome in terms of 
you know, now we have guidance on what we can do and what we shouldn't do. And I really have to say, this is driven by the science around it. It's not about being driven by panic. Hospitals are not getting the advice from people like us, <laughs> you know, doing live streams like mm. this. We are getting direction from them about how mm. they're responding to this. But it's an interesting chain of command. So we're, we're getting the science coming through. Yeah. And then, like, from my perspective, I'm expecting the government to act quickly based on the science. But we're seeing this delay. And what I've noticed is corporations really coming in and, and making sure that their their employees are working from home. Like, a lot of my Be patients are just... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so there's that, that social responsibility that's really coming through. Um, and it's, uh, from my perspective, it's a little bit disappointing to see that delay going on. And that lack of leadership. Um, but yeah, kudos to all the corporations that are yeah, treating their employees that's properly. We've I mean, yeah. really seen that with a lot of big companies uh, have been really, really quick to act and say to people, right, just work from home. I've also, um, some companies have divided up their workforce. So they've said, okay, uh, you work from one part of the city, this team work in this part of the city. So if one team gets sick, we've got a backup team. And it's, so it's, it's social isolation at scale. Exactly, just yeah. within their own company. Yeah. And that makes sense. Uh, Melissa Daisley asks, I think there's a question for you, Brad. I have symptoms, but I don't qualify for testing. What do I do? <laughs> um, so certainly uh, now, if you have any questions, you can certainly get in contact with your GP. Um, we have some Medicare codes that are available now, so you can have a phone call with your general practitioner and they'll be able to be paid to see you, which is a lot better for us yeah. rather than us working for free, so that's good. Uh, so that's sort of like the, the simplest thing to do. Um, if, you're, if you don't have, I suppose, the criteria at this point of time is that if you've got symptoms of having a common cold, but you haven't been travelling overseas, you haven't been in contact, with anybody who's been overseas and if you haven't been in contact with somebody who has been diagnosed with coronavirus, sorry that was a very long sentence, um, then uh, yeah, you, you're not fulfilling that criteria. But if, if you've got any worries, of course see a health professional and we'll hopefully be able to help you out. And then in the criteria there is the discretion um, as far as I'm aware that they, if the doctor is worried and you don't meet the criteria but they're concerned that you can have the test but they don't want to be testing people who don't need it because that will just overwhelm the system. Are we seeing that system being overwhelmed right now? Mm. I mean, I know someone personally who's waiting for results and they're not coming through as quickly mm. as he'd expected. Why is that? How is the pathology Our 24 system? turnaround time <laughs> for our tests <laughs> how, uh, is how, taking how, about uh, five how days. Is, yes. How is pathology? So is, is, it, is the system coping? I mean, when, as the number of cases grows more people are going to be wanting these test results and they're not going to be getting them quickly. No, exactly. So there, there is a bit of a funnel mechanism at the moment. So, and, and over this week, um, the, the numbers of swabs that are being sent off to pathology labs um, have just exponentially increased. Um, we've seen a lot of people going to the, the public hospital clinics that have, that have popped up, um, but a lot of them like, don't really have that many symptoms, don't fulfil that criteria. They are the, the worried well, so to speak. Um, they may have influenza, they may have mm -hmm. other common and cold viruses that are going around, um, but yeah, like not, not a major risk. Um, and what we're finding is that some uh, bosses are telling their, their employees to go and get a clearance. And this is a bit of a weird thing, because if we, if we do a swab, um, then we, we can sort of go, oh yes, you've got coronavirus, but, but we can't tell you if you don't really have it. So um, the, the swabs aren't perfect. So we expect if we're doing a, a throat swab and a nasal swab, that uh, the nasal swab is about sort of 60% likely to get a positive result if you do have it. Um, with a throat swab, it's about 30% likely um, if, we're, if we're doing that. Um, but yeah, it's not a way to sort of guarantee that you're going to be safe to visit Granny on the weekend. And the other thing just with the lab testing yeah. is now they're bringing the, they've um, accredited the private laboratories. Right. So up until the, the start of this week, it was only the public labs that could do it. So now private labs are coming on board. So and that's, how much capacity does that add? Well, that adds a lot. Yeah, right. So okay. that will really speed things up. But right. it is certainly that the 24-hour turnaround that we've been told is, is happening. It's d definitely not happening based on what doctors mm. have been telling us. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about self-isolation? What does that mean? So Andrea Story asks, what is self-isolation? Is there a backup in case you do get worse while you're in self-isolation? Do you get medication? We need to have more processes than just washing your hands. Once you are in isolation, you're kind of on your own. And someone at the office asked me today, like, does it mean that you can go out for a drive in your car just to get some fresh air? Even if you don't step out, does that count as self-isolation? Mm, well, that's a tricky right. one. I mean, self-isolation, from my understanding, would be that you really do need to make sure you're not coming into contact with people or surfaces. Or, so it really does mean you need to quarantine 
and keep yourself away from other people and other things. And so, if there is a risk, someone else might use that car, for instance. Exactly. So I would, I would say if you've been asked to self-isolate or quarantine, it's for a reason. And it really means you do need to stay at home and not go out of the house. Brad? So um, over in Italy, when people were just asked to stay at home, it wasn't really self-isolation, that people weren't sick, um, but they were sort of told that you can um, hop into your car and drive to the supermarket one person at a time, um, do your shopping and then keep away from everybody uh, and then go, go home. Um, or you could go to the pharmacy and home and that was the only transport that they could do. And that may be what we end up happening in Australia, so we will see. But if you're actually sick and, and you've been diagnosed with coronavirus, it puts you into a different category. So I would um, recommend for people to stay in their own house uh, as much as possible. Um, even even taking the dog for a walk can be a little bit of a difficulty. I wouldn't go around at, at rush hour on a, on a pedestrian pathway. Um, but yeah, like certainly uh, getting um, like online will probably go crazy for the moment with people buying uh, food online and having well, that delivered. I was just talking to someone though and they were saying they were trying to put in an online order from one of the supermarkets and they were told they couldn't be delivered for a week. Yeah, so, I've, I've heard of that too. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, it's, I think that the advice we were giving a little while back to sort of stock up, and, you know, it was, was good advice because um, things that we've depended on, like, oh, you can just go online and order all your shopping, that may not necessarily be as easy as we think. Uh, we've had a number of people asking uh, questions uh, relating to how things are working in regional Australia. When you are more, you know, far away from a medical facility um, and self-isolation kind of works one way and it doesn't in other ways because you know you're living with a family on a remote farm for instance. How's, how's it working in regional Australia right now? We take a lot for granted in the cities. We do. I, I don't think we know enough about what's going on there mm -hmm. to be to be frank. I think the a lot of most of the cases of people who've been diagnosed have been in the cities mm -hmm. so I'm not really aware of that many people who've been diagnosed in regional and rural areas. I know that part of the state and federal government funding arrangement that was announced a little while back was to designed to, if people are in those areas and remote communities and need help and medical help to pay for them to be brought to the city. So there are some structures in place for that to happen. And where can people get information about that? Um, look, I think the, the health department, the federal health department website probably is the most comprehensive information um, to, to find that sort of stuff. But it's also changing regularly. So you want to keep... You need to keep checking. You need to keep checking it. This is a bit like the Takata airbags um, sort of scenario. Different case, obviously, mm -hmm. but you need to keep checking. You need to keep checking and you need to keep going back and checking the information because what... And even the, the New South Wales Premier said that. She said, you know, what we're telling you today may not be what we tell you tomorrow. And that's that's not something we're really used to. We're used to hearing mm. something, oh, well, we, now we understand it. It's fact. Well, things are developing every day. Mm. Uh and we haven't been concentrating on rural or regional areas at the moment because everything is sort of like in, in capacity, high capacity, um, yeah, like where everybody is rubbing and shoulders with each other. Natural isolation. Yeah, so it will it will be a matter of time until um, the virus gets out into to different regional areas. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, it depends on how uh, how many people are meeting up at the, the town meeting uh, mm -hmm. for, for that transmission. One of the things that will help, though, for re regional and rural, Jeremy, is the, um, the Medicare item for telehealth. So that that will mean that you won't necessarily have to have a doctor in your in your town or whatever who can you can have a consultation with and that's really designed for people who may not have the access to medical care that they ha you have in the big city so that will help gypsy jack thank you for your question uh, gypsy jack has asked how safe is it to travel interstate on domestic flights so we're not talking about overseas going to iran and italy for instance we're just talking about within australia um, are we reaching a point where borders will be shut I'm not sure there's clear guidance on that, to be honest, in, ter in terms of what I've seen. I mean, I think it's, it's the common sense um, advice that we've been given about wash our hands, um, you know, hand sanitise. But in terms of the interstate travel, I know that, again, some companies, you mentioned, you know, companies sort of being on the front foot have uh, banned, well, not banned, but cancelled all um, non-essential interstate travel. Um, but that's just sort of as a precaution rather than saying it's sort of dangerous to travel. I think we... We need to find out from the authorities some more information about that because that's, that's a decision that a lot of people will have to be making. You know, should I travel next week to that, that meeting? So we, we've had, uh, I can't remember what your name was, but uh, someone asking, uh, Rhonda, um, Rhonda Tate, asking whether um, she should cancel her cruise. Her husband's, um, they booked a cruise in the South Pacific. Does Rhonda say how old she is? Uh, no, uh, Rhonda doesn't. She <laughs> says, I have, uh, my husband and I have a cruise booked for the South Pacific and New Zealand in 10 days. Should we cancel? 
It may be cancelled for you already. I hate <laughs> to say. Uh, so a lot of ports have already been closed. So um, so some of the cruisers could take off from Australia, but they can't actually <laughs> land anywhere. So uh, so th this is a, a problem. My my parents were uh, were booked to go on a cruise, yep. and that is no longer in existence. So um, th this is happening across the board. Um, I, I think it would be dangerous to to go on a cruise at the moment um, because it can spread quite easily, and we've seen that on multiple um, multiple <laughs> examples yep. around the world. And I think also if you were thinking about going on a cruise, your own personal health really needs to be taken into consideration, your age, um, pre-existing health conditions, because if, if there is an outbreak and you have any of those other risk factors, you're going to be at a much greater increased risk of developing a more serious case of it than if you are a young, healthy person. But like you say, Brad, I think in, in a lot of instances, people, the decision might be made for yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for everyone for your questions that are coming in uh, very rapidly. Uh, I'm just sort of a lot of comments as well, a lot of observations that I'm trying to sort of sit through in real time. The other thing just on the cruise thing is yes, the um, yeah, Centre for Disease Control in the US actually put out a, um, a direction in the last little um, couple of days saying they actually recommend people not travel on cruises in, in the short term. So okay. that's a, that was official advice mm -hmm. from the CDC. And the question before was yeah, interstate travel. Yep. I think um, if it's non-essential travel, then stay at home. That's really the advice that we're, they were saying. If you do need to travel, um, one of my patients was asking me this week about it um, and trying without clear guidance, mm. um, my, my patient was saying, well, should I wear a mask when I'm on the plane? So at the moment, if somebody does has been diagnosed with coronavirus, we're contacting the people two rows in front and two rows behind yeah. and sort of saying, well, yeah, you would have been within like about a metre or two. So you could be at risk of getting the, the virus. Um, so w if you wear a mask, you've really got to keep it on for the whole, the whole flight. Um, wash your hands afterwards, take the mask off, chuck it in the bin, wash your hands again, um, and make sure that you're very, very careful about it. So some people are like taking their mask off to eat, um, which again will just sort of disrupt Feet everything purpose, and defeat the yeah. person wearing a mask as well. So I think some of that is like common sense, um, but yeah, we don't have clear guidance on that at this point of time. But it's, I think that's something we do need, and I think that's something we should be chasing up. Uh, can you get COVID-19 twice? So if you've had it, you recover, can you get it again by coming into contact with someone else? Well, there, there was one paper that was put out that suggested that, but then it's sort of been not discredited, but it's sort of the, the people have sort of stepped back from that saying, oh, maybe you, you can't get it twice. I, I again think it's too early to know. We know that people do get it and they recover and they recover well, but I'm, there's, I'm not aware of many instances of people getting it twice. Mm. Yeah, it's still an unknown quantity. Um, I think the, the whole thing that we talk about with um, with the common cold itself is that um, you can get one strain, but then it will mutate, and then you'll get another strain later on in life. And so you you don't gather you gather immunity, but only for that particular one unit that's coming along. Um, there have been some cases of people getting a similar coronavirus twice, um, but we we really don't know if that's going to be the case for this one or not. So I hope not, um, but we we just don't know at this point in time. Adam Tate has this question, why is the death rate being expressed as a percentage of total infections rather than a percentage of resolved cases? Do you have an answer for that? Why, why, why we're sort of seeing, I guess what he's pointing to is that a lot of people are recovering from yep. this. They're, they're well, they're perfectly fine, they didn't even get that sick. Um, are we making it look no, well, it's or, or, it's, it's, by, by, by the way it's being expressed. Point, but I think yeah. if you look at population health and the way it's measured mm -hmm. as a whole, is that, that's just the way they measure this things. This is the so, system. Yeah, yeah, they look at the number of people that get a particular condition and they look at the number of people, you know, the, 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 the case fatality rate yeah. is mm. the number of people who die from having that particular condition. And, and they don't just look at the number of people who recover from it. So that's really, if you think of any, any illness and how we measure, you know, fatalities in any illness, it's done by looking at the number of people who get it and the number of people who die from it. So it would be a bit tricky to sort of to yeah. change that to just who's recovered. So I, I think, yeah, like it's either you say 1% of people mm -hmm. are dying or you've got a 99% chance of surviving. Exactly. Yay! Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah, is the cup half full yeah. or half <laughs> empty? So uh, I suppose it's a way of, of us sort of comparing um, like well, influenza. Like, so yeah. we say that influenza has a 0.1% chance of killing you, um, but coronavirus has a 1% chance. Mm -hmm. So 10 times the likelihood of, of killing somebody. And so this is how we think 
about it that there would be 10 times the number of people dying from coronavirus compared to a typical flu season coming through. So, and, um, and that means you can really compare apples with apples, doesn't it? Yeah. By, by putting in the way yeah. that we deal with other illnesses. Yeah. But it's also difficult to tell the resolved cases as well because there is a lag time. So we, we know if, if there's a positive result. Yeah, yeah, it flicks over at the lab. We know if somebody's dead because yeah, they're yeah. dead. Yeah. Um, it's recorded. But then it, it, people will recover, and but that recovery time it, it could be very variable and it's much more difficult to follow people up and say, hey, are you still alive? So yeah. we have much more like, yeah, um, d defined numbers if we're looking at the death rate versus the infection rate. Uh, Will Davidson asks this question, one of a number of people asking this question, how is the vaccine process going? Yeah, look, it's going well, but, I, you know, Australia's got um, some runs on the ball. We've got the University of Queensland, who's uh, got some great technology. They're working on developing a novel vaccine, and what will happen is their, their vaccine candidate will be sent down to the CSIRO in Geelong, where the virus is living, and they will test it there. But I think, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of concerned that people are concerned about a vaccine because these things take a long time. Mm. These things are not going to happen in months. They'll have to be testing. They've got to be tested. Yeah. They've got to be. They've got to see, be seen that it can kill the virus. Then you've got to see it in an animal model, and then you've got to move to human trials. So I think the the, mo the re most realistic expectation would be would be twelve to eighteen months for a vaccine. That's a long time. Yeah, I mean, but considering that's, what's happening. That's, that's pretty quick. Like, compared to 1918, really? yeah. like, we're, doing, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. So, yeah, like, and, and that's the thing. Like, we, we do need to test it. We need to know that it's safe. We don't want to cause a whole lot of problems from vaccinating everybody yeah. Yeah. Um, and then killing a bunch of people from the vaccine. So we need to know that it's safe and it will take that time. Um, and, yeah, I would be saying realistically 12 to 18 months as well. Um, people were saying six months. No, uh, that, that's not likely. But we want, we want to get it right and we want to make sure it's safe and we want to make sure that yeah people are going to be able to have it and, uh, and, and safely. yeah that it's going to work. I'm conscious uh, a number of people have asked this question as well about um, seasonality uh, and the fact that the northern hemisphere is going into summer does that improve their chances of bouncing back and what about us we're heading into winter mm. How does that shape up for us then? Well, well it's you, bad for you us. Answer yeah, that, Sophie. It's yeah. bad for us actually because um, what we're heading into is the double whammy of having the flu season as well as the coronavirus. So the regular flu plus the coronavirus yeah. plus doctors with a day job of just looking after <laughs> everyone else who kind of falls ill. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the weather's not going to be in our favour. Mm. Um, so I, I think that's right. And uh, But on the other hand, like we still don't know. So we're, we are seeing that things have been pretty terrible in the northern hemisphere and particularly around uh, Italy. Um, we hope hope that as, as the summer months come along that, that things will improve, um, but we, we really don't know. And we're still seeing the spread very quickly uh, throughout Australia and the weather's still been relatively warm and hot. So I, I can't say that the, that the, the sun will save people. Um, I, I think that the virus is, can still spread from people to people even, even during the summer months. And, and one thing that might make a difference too is, the, and, and the reason people get more, more colds and flu in winter is because we stay inside. Um, and usually with a lot of people, we might go to the movies or we might go to other, you know, spend a lot of time in shopping centres. Um, if these big gatherings are not going to be happening, you're not going to be around people who can infect you. So that mm. might change things slightly. Yeah, all right. Uh, look, that is all we have time for, unfortunately. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. They've been absolutely terrific, uh, and I've learned a few things as well today. <laughs> so thank you both, uh, Sophie Scott, Brad Mackay. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to be doing this live stream every week, and we're going to be gathering up your questions through the week, so please keep them coming via the ABC News website. Join us on Facebook as well, and as we've been saying throughout this live stream, uh, you need to keep up to date. The information is changing uh, at a very, very rapid rate, sometimes at a daily rate. So keep up to date with the information. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you can stay up to date with the latest information on the special coverage page of the ABC News website as well. That's at abc.net.au slash coronavirus. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back live for another stream next week. For now, though, goodbye.